Good evening, I'm Virginia Prescott, and welcome to the Atlanta History Center's virtual author talk series. I work at School of Humans Audio, and tonight I'm very much looking forward to our conversation with Sam Canonis about The Least of Us, True Tales of America and Hope in the Time of Fentanyl and Meth. You can purchase The Least of Us directly from the Atlanta History Center's bookstore using the link in the chat. It's at the right of your screen. And as Sam and I are talking tonight, please do submit questions. You can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And I'm gonna try and integrate as many of those into the conversation as time allows. So please don't hesitate. We're really happy to welcome Sam Canonis back to the Author Talk series. He's a journalist, he's a storyteller and former Los Angeles Times reporter and author of four books of narrative nonfiction. The Least of Us is a follow-up to his landmark book, Dreamland, The True Tale of America's Opiate Epidemic. It was really a groundbreaking book which ignited awareness of the epidemic that was responsible for hundreds of thousands of deaths in the United States. It won the National Book Credit Circle Award and the Best Nonfiction Book of 2015 and landed on numerous best books lists of the year. And then we learn, as we learn in The Least of Us, there are far more stories to be told about addiction in America, including how people and communities are fighting back. Sam, thank you so much for being with us tonight. It's very nice to be with you, Virginia. Thank you very much for doing this. Appreciate it. Well, it, it really is a fascinating book. And, and I want to just start with Dreamland because that really was the book that awakened a lot of people to the devastation of the opioid epidemic. But you're, you're a longtime newspaper reporter, so you're used to moving on to the next thing. What is it that brought you back to this story of America's addiction crisis? Well, I would say it, initially I didn't really want to. I was pretty much exhausted by Dreamland. It was such an um, enormous amount of work. And um, I also didn't really know what would could follow it. Um, I, I really didn't know what would be, could be worse than heroin initially. I mean, for a bit. And then I began to realize that fentanyl was taking, but I also began to travel all over the country and uh, give talks uh, about Dreamland, about the opioid epidemic uh, to small towns, to uh, conferences of professionals of different kinds, judges, public health workers, et cetera, on and on and on. There were many, many of these speeches. And that's when I kind of began to see what was going on uh, all, across the, all across the country. And, and as I dug deeper into it, I began to understand that that it was actually, uh, you know, I watched fentanyl take over mm -hmm. and uh, become the, the substitute, uh, synthetic substitute for heroin. But then I realized that this was actually a part of a much larger story. And that was the, the evolution away from plant-based drugs in the trafficking world and in Mexico and toward uh, synthetic drugs. And that's when it kind of became this larger story that I can kind of see how, how when I began to see how it all fit together and how making your drugs is much more profitable, much better business proposition than growing them. Uh, I, it was a big, it was an interesting uh, um, insight. And, and, and also I, I saw that this was a major shift for the trafficking world in Mexico. I lived in Mexico for 10 years. And when I was down there, you know, the, tra the drug trafficking pioneers and their children really were all farmers or ranchers. And so shifting away from that land, shifting away, shifting away from what's growing, what you can grow is, is, a, is a big deal. But it was, it, I began to understand that that was now the story and that the supply, the enormous supply of opioid painkillers, which doctors and pharmaceutical companies had unleashed, had dimmed somewhat, somewhat, and that in their place, the traffickers had stepped in to cover the country with uh, with these two drugs, meth, methamphetamine and fentanyl principally. Well, we will definitely dig into the specifics of that. And, and, and what you do in the book uncover the supply chain and, and the market and the people and the communities affected by these synthetic drugs that are now flooding America. Right. And it, just to get a picture, you know, provisional data from the CDC finds an estimated 100,306 drug overdose deaths in the US. This was the first 12 month period ending in April, 2021, 87,000 the year before that. So this is this is a result of this you know, colossal shift that you trace, the highest number yet, yet not something we do hear about a lot. Do you, do you think those numbers got lost in the pandemic news? Uh, certainly, yeah, of course. And, and, um, 
And, and you know, I, I want to say that that was necessarily wrong. It, it's, you know, we have a worldwide pandemic on our hands, we're going to say it, it's so, something, you know, our focus shifted. On the other hand, this doesn't stop just because um, COVID is there. In fact, I would say that it really um, is magnified because of COVID. With COVID, uh, we all isolated, as we all know. Mm -hmm. And really, for people who are addicts or, or, or recovering addicts, the, the thing that they always tell you when you're in drug treatment, rehabilitation, is don't isolate. Mm -hmm. Be around other people. Go to meetings and and be a mentored or be a mentor to someone. Um, and, and, and all of that had to shut down and the meetings were on Zoom as we are now, and we all know the story. Um, the, the key thing, the, 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 one of the great tragedies of COVID that I don't think has been properly explained or, or talked about, I hope that this book does, is to, is to talk about the, 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 the COVID hit right at the time when the drug trafficking world in Mexico had succeeded essentially effectively in covering the United States with these two drugs. So when you relapsed, you were not relapsing on anything kind of innocuous. People were relapsing and the drugs that they found most available to them were fentanyl, extraordinarily deadly, very most potent drug we've ever known on the street, essentially, and, and, and methamphetamine which is a drug that we can talk about, but is accompanied, we've found across the country, the, me the way they're making meth down in Mexico, the, the product is accompanied by rapid onset um, uh, symptoms of, of mental illness, essentially, so meth-induced psychosis and so on, homelessness, tent encampments and all that. And so all of that was, was kind of the, the product of COVID as it, as it collided with this drug uh, problem. It wasn't just. It just wasn't very well covered because our focus, budget, priorities, everything else was was on was on COVID. Right. And this this is this is the, the, what some call the fourth wave of the addiction crisis. What you're pointing out here: first, pain pills, then heroin, as you uh, wrote about in Dreamland extensively, then fentanyl, and now stimulants such as methamphetamine and these synthetic drugs, fentanyl and methamphetamine. But a little more on fentanyl, like a, a primer on it. What is it? And, and when did we first start seeing it sure. as a street drug in the U.S.? Yeah, fentanyl is actually a magnificent drug when used in medically. Uh, I've had fentanyl. I had a heart attack five years ago. They gave me fentanyl. I'm very glad that they did. It was invented in 1960. It revolutionized surgery when it was invented. Um, and uh, it allowed for the quick in, quick out of, of anesthesia. And, and that was not the case before that. And, uh, uh, and it became very quickly part of the, the operating room uh, all across the country, really, I think in many parts of the world, uh, fentanyl was. Um, however, it, it, it's, it, it, its benefits to surgery were, all, were that it was extraordinarily potent. It could get you very quickly into kind of a, uh, an anesthetized state. And um, it was much more potent than morphine and heroin and ever, all the other op opioids. And uh, this was fine so long as it was confined to the operating room, but it, it very quickly became kind of discovered by underground chemists. It didn't really reach the potency the, 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 as, as a destructive force that we're seeing today until the Sinaloa drug cartel figured it out in 2006. That's when they had never heard of such a thing, a synthetic heroin. Uh, underground chemist uh, told them about this and uh, with pretty short order, they figure out that this is the way to go. Chinese chemical companies then in the 2013, 14, 15, begin to sell it on the dark web and, and you begin to see it mailed to people. People in the United States who are like low level dealers don't really know what they're doing. They mix it very badly. And you're beginning to see these uh, early on, you begin to see these um, just a, a, a enormous clusters of overdoses in one weekend, 60 or 80 overdoses in one one weekend, uh, that kind of that kind of thing. But eventually the Mexican trafficking world figures out how to make fentanyl and and it becomes uh, by 2017, 18, I have to say, I think they were making it and it was a staple of their of their product, you know, uh, off offering. It's an extraordinarily potent opioid, very similar in, in its effect on the brain to heroin, just much, much more, 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 more potent. And it in it, um, it very easily kills 
if you don't handle it right, which is the very definition of how what's going on in the drug world. People don't know how to handle it. They mix it badly. It's not like a pharmaceutical company, which has studied how to mix mm -hmm. um, very, very assiduously how to mix this stuff. So you're seeing it used by people who are mo profit motivated, don't really know what they're doing, probably don't care too much. The only thing they care about is not dying themselves when they're mixing it, which is, has happened. And so all of this is where is how fentanyl kind of comes on the scene. And, and of course, it, it comes in a, uh, on, a, on a population that has already been addicted to first, you know, uh, pain pills, as you say, and then, and then heroin. It just becomes the substitute for heroin. But then the supply expands so much so that now traffickers and dealers are using, primarily lower level street dealers are using it to mix into other drugs like cocaine to um, just boost their, their local product. I want to pick up on some of the things that you talked about, the, the Mexican drug cartels, because this was a, a, a huge shift. And this is something you've spent a lot of time reporting on in Mexico, reporting in Mexico, and then, of course, covering crime there. But this is at a time, uh, 2005, 2006, DEA agents didn't even know what fentanyl was at this right. time. And they were these some big busts that exposed the cartels manufacturing in these Walter White like setups, you know, labs kind of clean um, and these sources in China that you mentioned selling things on the dark web. And in fact, you say this was drug trafficking for the 20th century. Well, what do you mean by that? How How is it different than in previous waves? Well, it it, it didn't need fentanyl really. Um, now, the drug drug trafficking groups in, in, in Mexico have have industrialized fentanyl. But initially, you could you didn't need a cartel. You didn't need anybody to uh, of some sinister group that you had to connect with to to buy it. You could buy it on the web, and still you can still buy it on the web. It's just that so much of it now comes from Mexico. Right. And so so this all was you not need, Scarface. I'm sorry. This was not Scarface. No, no, no. Far from Scarface idea. Far from the uh, you know Chapo Guzman kind of idea. It was just local folks understanding that if they had a laptop. They had a FedEx or a UPS or a, just a regular U.S. mail uh, connection. Um, they could buy it on on the web, and what's more, it promised like lottery sized profits too, bigger profits than you could ever imagine because so little of it was. It's just so potent, so little of it made people high. Of course, the problem is a little bit more killed them. And so this was the problem that the drug trafficking, the dealers at the lower levels began to see their their lottery sized profits connected up to mixing mm -hmm. a drug. Now, you can't say uh, 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 enough to get you high fentanyl, enough to get you high as a few grand, grand, the equivalent of a few grains of salt. A few more than that will kill you, as I said. But you can't, as a dealer, sell a few grains worth of this drug. You have to mix it with powder that's, you know, harmless and doesn't do anything. But that's the, so that's, they found that these profits were connected to their ability to mix. First time really in the history of, of American drug trafficking when you found widespread folks figuring out that the, what they had to do was mix it now and then they could they could sell. The problem is, of course, as I said, they're very, very bad at it. They use the um, uh, uh, initially for, for a couple of years, there three years or so, uh, the, it, it was the myth that the best way to mix fentanyl with other powders was with a magic bullet, a blender, which is an insane idea. But nevertheless, crew and you know, narcotics agents would find magic bullet blenders at many of these at these mix sites. Either that, or, you know, coffee grinders. But it seemed like the magic bullet blender because it has that little plastic bulb over. You know, you these things you can buy them at Target for twenty nine ninety five. They're great for making smoothies. We have one. It's just not for mixing powders. And um, the mixes that those people would come up with were just awful. And that is why you begin to see initially the first. Uh, you know, episodes of fentanyl episodes in in uh, in the last few years were were like large numbers of overdoses because the mix was so was so bad, and and that really remains in, uh, widely imperfect. Um, the stuff that's coming through now. So the, this minuscule investment, uh, uh, you know, turned a lot of people. You you there was yeah. a woman that you speak to who is struggling, uh, smuggling pills over the border in her spanks, you know, other people right. who are mixing it up in their magic blenders. And sim similarly, synthetic methamphetamine 
uh, makes, what'd you say, this guy sitting in his mother's uh, basement into a kingpin. You know, everybody's Pablo Escobar suddenly dealing drugs. Exactly. And, and that is the that's that's due to the fact that the supplies of these drugs can be made in just in enormous quantities. You no longer need land, rainfall, sunlight. You no longer need seasons. All you need is a port. And they got several on the Pacific Coast side of Mexico that the traffickers have have control of that you can get massive quantities of these of these chemicals in which to make these these drugs. And so now you're getting um, the supplies of both of these drugs are, are just so enormous, so staggering. They've covered the country. This has never happened before that one generalized source has has covered the country with one, a drug, let alone let alone two. But what that means is the supplies are so large. And what that means is that the, that anybody can find large quantities of it. it. Used to be you had to belong to one of these groups. You had to kind of work your way up, earn trust and all. And now it's like almost anybody can sell 20 pounds of the stuff, 50, 50 pounds of the stuff. And I met people who were, who were doing that. And of course, a lot of what will happen is a lot of people don't really know how to be a big time drug trafficker. It's not an easy thing to do. And and then they get they get caught up. And then, of course, they're caught with these large amounts of drugs. And then they go to prison for many, many years, you know. And so but that all all of this is is a function of the enormous supply that we're seeing flooding in from from Mexico right now. Well, that's, that's, that's the here. irony almost that there aren't cartels operating. Cartels actually have to care about keeping their customers alive. No, I, I think that there's a basic understanding that the customer is not going to care. The customer will take what we give them in a sense. You know, now you're seeing, as you mentioned, uh, the trafficking world down in Mexico has been producing counterfeit pain pills for four years. And they come in looking exactly like a Xanax bar or a Percocet or something. There's a variety of pills that they do. Um, you know, and these, these all contain only fentanyl. And, um, and, and, and they're, they're, they're selling them because it's easier to smuggle these pills. They don't disintegrate. It's, 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 it's value added. You get more, more money for it. And so, and, and now they're selling them on the, 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 they've made so many of them, million, tens of millions of these pills, I think are really in the country. Now they're making so many of them that, that the, I, the, the problem that drug, tra drug dealers used to have is where, do, where do I, what, where do, where do I get my dope to sell? That's been solved. That's not a problem anymore. They are now, um, the big issue is where do I sell all the drugs that I can get my hands on? And that one of the places they're selling is on um, social media apps like Snapchat, Instagram. And these are normally small scale dealers, no selling to kids because that's who uses those, those apps. Often the dealers themselves are pretty young, you know, under, under 25, certainly. But you get this whole idea that, that, the, that the trafficking world down in Mexico is saying, let's just make it and let's not care what the, what, whether the customer wants it, needs it, is threatened by it or anything like that. They're kind of divorced from all that, as you say, and it's just a, it's a, it's a danger. That's, that's one of the reasons it's so dangerous. They have understood that the dealers here, the, the addicts here will use it regardless of whatever they make. Question here from Patricia. Many states, Illinois as an example, have legislation pending to make fentanyl test strips more widely available. Yet there is legislator resistance under the belief that they can't step up and pass the legislation at a time of higher crime in their communities. What are your ideas to help the legislators see that this is a health and public policy issue that will help keep people alive and not increase crime? It is, it, it can, the, the fentanyl test strip can be extraordinarily helpful in for those people who do not want to use drugs without wanting to use fentanyl. Um, that's, that's, that's not, I mean, a lot of people now want to use fentanyl. They are addicted to fentanyl. And I'll get into that in just a minute. But, but basically, this is for people who are using, say, cocaine and don't want to actually be using fentanyl. It's very helpful to be able to do that. Um, and it's now necessary because drug dealers all over the place are, 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 are mixing fentanyl with, with cocaine. One issue, though, with fentanyl test strips is when you get people who are uh, addicted, they want fentanyl in their drugs. Okay. That, that, so th I have, I know of at least one case in one of which a fairly important regional 
drug dealer in uh, Eastern Tennessee was told me that, that when she would meet with her wholesaler, she would t- give him test strips to make sure that he tested whatever he bought to make sure that it had fentanyl in it. Um, you get that when people are addicted. And that's what's happening now. We are now seeing where people are have survived their initial exposures to fentanyl and now are addicted. And this is many parts of the country. I don't know everything about this, but it's certainly I've talked to people in many areas. And there's clearly people who are now are asking uh, for fentanyl and would never buy anything that didn't have fentanyl because they're now addicted. That means that heroin is virtually worth, worthless in many parts of the country on the streets because it will not uh, blunt or get rid of the, the dope sickness. It will not get rid of the withdrawals. Only fentanyl will do it now because it's so much more, more potent. I think in a few years, we won't see any heroin uh, at, at all. Yeah, this is the thing about the market, uh, the marketplace that you expose here, the, t- the test market research, you know, sending small amounts of drugs into areas just to see how it goes. Branding, competition, you know, once dealers start lacing their drugs with Fetty, uh, co- competitors have to follow. Um, yes, uh, and I think no. once once that happens, once people in, in a certain area become, then then every dealer has to has to add fentanyl to to whatever it is they're selling you cannot you will not have any customers if you if you don't the reason initially too that you would want to add fentanyl to cocaine say is first of all to kind of boost it i think if initially it was thought that it would be a good boost but then eventually people understood very quickly very short order i don't think this took long to figure out that you get if you add fentanyl to cocaine you replace a cocaine user who may buy from you every few days or every weekend and maybe take a vacation from cocaine for a month or whatever, you're getting a person now who's addicted to an opioid and that person has to buy every single day. It just can't, you cannot not buy, buy the drug. And so that is one of the reasons why people always ask me, why would they want to add fentanyl and risk killing their paying customer? They do risk that, but they also understand that they can expand their customer base significantly. And in many areas, that's exactly what's happened. Mm -hmm. Uh, We've talked a lot about fentanyl and you mentioned a couple of things about meth that I'd love to talk more about because you, there are these startling stories uh, that you have in the book and, and a lot of neuroscience research about the effects of drug on the brain. But the stories that I'm thinking of are terrifying scenes of people experiencing extreme paranoia, uh, signs of psychosis, um, taking this meth that you talked about synthetic it's all synthetic but you know the new meth i guess any any stories that particularly brought home to you how terrifying this is yeah sure i mean that that was an interesting part of the book because it came at the very end see my initial story was to write that they are now able to cover the country with methamphetamine and essentially they have done that there's meth now up in new england new england never had any meth locally made or internationally made at all. It just was really not a non-meth region. Now it's got meth everywhere, right? And so, uh, but then as I was ending the book, uh, um, it, 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 I stumbled on this story that, it, that was told by one guy in particular, a guy named Eric Barrera, uh, a wonderful guy, and in, in, uh, who was then a homeless outreach coordinator, but had been a meth user for many years and had felt the meth change. One year, he said, all of a sudden, the meth was different. I was a party drug before. So I was everybody's best friend and staying up for day. And now it was like sinister. And I was parent, horribly paranoid and stabbing the walls of his girlfriend's apartment, thinking had a, she had a man on the walls, that kind of thing. And she, he said that that never changed until I got sober again. Um, I, I, I just felt that that kind of crazed uh, paranoia. And, and I began to think, well, if the meth that he's talking about has that symptom, had that effect on him, maybe it, I should find out. I should ask people. And so I began for about two, three months. I just called people all over the country saying, what are you seeing? Are you seeing when the meth arrived in your area? Because this meth began to march across the country, the more they were able to make it, make it beginning in 2013 in the Midwest in about 2017 and up into New England about 2019. He called people in these different areas. And when meth arrived in your area, what'd you see? And, and, and the stories were so similar. It was remarkable. Everybody was talking about how 
crazed people got and, 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 and tent encampments form. People are very quickly are homeless. And so the tent encampments form as a place, kind of a, a little, you know, community of meth, largely of meth users, of course, using pretty much anything that's available. And um, I, I, I met this one woman. She was just so she was the two, the, the only two people I met who were sober from this meth were Eric and, and this woman. And she had been, you know, barking like a dog on this methamphetamine. She was at really incapable of holding on to her life and things were going out of control. She gets sober but still six months after she's used for the last time, she still feels that her personality has not returned. She cannot feel empathy. She, her brain feels permanently changed. And she sat down one evening in the, in the sober living house with her roommate. Her roommate was watching a movie and, she, and, and the movie was um, made in Manhattan with um, Jennifer Lopez, kind of a you know, rom-com schmaltzy thing. And the, she told me all of a sudden I just began to cry at this movie because I could find of tears of happiness, really, because she could kind of feel some kind of empathy for the character. And it was the beginning of but it was still six months after she had stopped using. It was a remarkable thing. I spoke to her two months, two years after she had gotten sober. Um, teeth were just melted almost by this stuff. And now she had to have massive dental work. But she told me this very poignant thing. She said, you know, they've taught us how to deal with this, like through meditation and yoga. And that's all wonderful, but it's not enough. I can still feel two years into this, into sobriety, that my brain has still not returned to normal. I hope that they will do research because I would like to do more than just know how to do more than just meditate and, and, and practice yoga as a way of, of, of healing my brain. And I don't know what else to do now. It was one of these moments when it was like, my God, this is, this stuff is, is um, frightening. And I would say that this is something I kept on, kept on hearing that people do not, once they stop using with the old form of making methamphetamine, they, they would kind of like sleep for a few days and be more or less back to normal. It would take a little bit longer, but the brain was functioning a little bit, you know, and, and they were this th themselves. And now this stuff seems to strip both the memory, uh, seems to strip the personality, seems to strip all empathy from 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 the from people who use it, even well into sobriety. Well, the, the, there are a lot of stories of people who have been through recovery, you know, gone through hell and and gotten to recovery, and and the human toll of those who couldn't recover, uh, others who stepped up in really startling ways, even in small towns, you know, where they thought the drug epidemic is something that you see on the news, not something that's here. Um, there's a woman, Angie Manny, who founded a, the TLC clinic in Elizabethtown, Tennessee. Just right. an amazing story, an amazing woman, and, yeah. and, and who adopted the child of an addict. Can you tell us about right. that? And, and, you know, that's these kinds of stories were became the heart and soul of the book. A, 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 a lot of the book deals with fentanyl and meth, and it's a very sinister story and very scary and and definitely uh, worth worthy of our attention. Absolutely. Um, but I began to feel that the bigger story here was um stories that the way I wanted to illustrate our defense, what we do about it. And I don't have a prescription of template of bullet points. This is what you do. Boom, boom, boom. Rather, the idea is to say that what we, what we, I, in my best hunches, what we need to do is to, to rebuild in so many ways that we have destroyed, rebuild community in many areas. And this frequently does not involve some magic bullet answer, some big solution, one size fits all kind of thing. It, it really involves paying attention locally, being involved intensely at the local level in, in whatever house of worship, whatever school, uh, business group, um, service club, uh, all these kinds of things are, are essential of pe people working in small ways at the smallest level, not worrying if they're not saving the world in some virtuous Way, but rather understanding the, the 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 real message of the opioid epidemic, really of the pandemic as well, which is that we are better together. Mm -hmm. We are only as strong as the most vulnerable. We're only as strong as 
as the least of us. And so Angie's story was just that. It was a woman who who, who told a, a young girl, a young lady who uh, it was comes from a very tough family um, that, you know, and at, at one point, I, you know, she's in a position to help her. I'll help you with whatever you need. And then years later, um, she understands that this woman is now a essentially a vegetable in a in a in a nursing home and but is pregnant and has given birth or was pregnant and has given birth while in that condition to a baby. And so she, Angie becomes her sister's keeper in a sense, right? I mean, she becomes the she she and her husband now well into their empty nester period, they thought adopt this young, young child who's a, a, a you know, grown, uh, a, you know, is about a month old at that two months old at that point, and um, born to this woman in a, who is a vegetable, essentially. And, um, and they become also the caretaker, in a sense of, of this young woman, Char, Starla Haas, who, who, who by now is in a nursing home, but the only people who come to visit Starla Haas are, um, are Angie and, this little girl that she has that she has uh, adopted along with her with her husband, the, her family, uh, her husband, she and, and the baby are the only ones who really come visit her. To me, this feels like the idea that I'm trying to get across. Not that not that there's a prescription a pres prescriptive nature to this idea. It's simply that when we pay attention to the local stuff and when we when we get involved at, at the local level in small ways, that that is how we make greater strides towards constructing these, a bulwark against drug, uh, drugs and drug addiction, but also many other things. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think, remember the most important, powerful force, we still have it in us. We evolved as humans to need, not just find it a, 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 a good, but need community, Me, need that. We, we would never have survived as a species. Had we all just kind of wandered off and, and done our own thing, we'd have been eaten. You know? So to me, this is essential. And we've gotten away from that, and particularly in America in the last 40 years, seems to me. And, and so the idea behind a lot of those stories was to tell just tales, just tales of people doing that, you know? Yeah. I, that that's the, the one of the most moving things about this. I, I remember actually reading a quote once from a scientist saying that we aren't the survival of the fittest, we are the survival of the nurtured. You know, it's through yes. us being together. It's a oh, I think thing. that's absolutely that's a very good point. I don't think that we we're all very into self reliance, American individualism, and we all know that none of us we we have created none of this by ourselves. A question from somebody who wants to remain anonymous: Growing up in a region where meth use was prevalent, I saw a lot of absent parents, sick children, and job loss. Many people connected to the fallout from drug use found their capacity to empathize is exhausted. In your yes. research, did you find examples of how communities work to overcome this exhaustion? So many great examples here. In fact, I don't know if you had something else in mind, but I just loved hearing about the, the courts and the sheriff's department in Hardin County, Ohio. Yeah, right. I mean, this was a, a, a tough, you know, sheriff, uh, tobacco chewing, fox watching sheriff who um, once he became, he was a deputy, once he becomes sheriff, he understands, you know what, we're not dealing with this problem of addiction very well. And um, so he goes around trying to proselytize the idea that local businesses should hire recovering addicts and give them a, you know, a chance to move forward with their, with their lives. At one point, one of the business owners says, well, are you doing that? Are you hiring anybody at the sheriff's department? Well, we can't, you know, but he, the sheriff begins to think about this and say, you know, we, uh, so he finds some money and in, in his budget and he hires one of the more notorious addicts in the in the county that they, has been in his jail a few times actually several times and gives him a job versus a janitor and watches first the deputies don't want to have anything to do with them this is bringing the street into their real their their sanctuary and and what are we doing and this is the first time they've known an addict who wasn't in handcuffs you know, and so they're not really into, but a little by little the whole department comes to watch this guy Rob Bird gradually repair his mind. It takes a while again. He's, he's, he's it, but eventually he's getting to the point, you know, where he can remember things again and this kind of stuff. And then eventually they make him, um, he it takes a job as the dispatcher. He learns how to be a dispatcher over the radio, uh, calling in, you know, lost dog and helicopters and all these different kinds of 
these different kinds of calls. It's a it's 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 one of those stories. When I first I first met the sheriff at one of my uh, uh, Keith Everhart at one of my uh, speeches, and in five minutes he tells me the story of what I kind of what I just told you. And, and I'm like, oh man, I got to go out there and see that, you know, that's, that's, that's the kind of thing. It's also, you know, what, what I love about that is story too. And I love covering is it's about Americans changing their minds. Mm. And, you know, in, in, in the, in the media landscape of today, where do you see anybody changing his or her mind? You know, on, on cable news, it's basically a business model based on the idea that nobody ever changes his mind. Now, I know in my case, I changed my mind constantly with this book, with both of these books. I was letting the facts lead, lead me. One time I'd have an idea what was true, and then pretty soon I'd be had that exploded. We are constantly changing our minds. And yet when, when you see in the media, you almost find no examples of people doing this. And so people changing their minds in the, you know, Keith Everhart in uh, Hardin County. I, 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 the story that I, I um, also loved was the story of Clarksburg, West Virginia, where the churches were, uh, that were in downtown, these old churches had really lost most of their congregation. Now they had, um, they had seen all around them as this meth pours into the town for the first time. All of a sudden, the, the downtown's filled with, with homeless, deranged homeless people that the churches are scared of. And everyone, everyone in the congregation blocks the door and all this. And, but then as time goes on, they kind of get to know the, the, the folks who are homeless, get to know their stories a little bit. And then comes the summer, the, the winter, I'm sorry, of 19, 2019, with the polar vortex coming in from the north at temperatures predicted uh, that will kill all the people on the street. And so the churches open their doors, essentially, as warming centers for these deranged people who are repellent to everybody in town. They're destroying houses. You don't have to, you can't leave a house unoccupied for three days before they'll come in and rip out the copper wiring and all that. That's a the churches respond and kind of open their doors to these kind of the most, you know, odorous, repellent rabble and save the meth users of Clarksburg uh, from this vicious, vicious winter that's coming down uh, from the north. And through that, through understanding that the church is not the four walls and the leaky roof, the church is the congregation is the town, the community. They, be, they have found a little bit of rejuvenation, it seems to me, and they found also ta- townspeople eager to, to, to be part of that. So many people have been so isolated, they don't know how to deal with what's going on around them. When they find a way to be part of it, you find this natural generosity and charity on, uh, from Americans. And that's what the, the Clarksburg story, that's, the Clarksburg story is about a lot of different things, but that's one of the most important, powerful things I found myself in all this. Well, right. This is, this is, this is, I think why it's uh, the true tales of America and hope, right. That, that this, it raises much bigger questions uh, about the dissolution of communities and bonds and not, you know, you're, you spend time in Indiana, Ohio, Tennessee, West Virginia, uh, Kentucky, these states, uh, their economies have just been hollowed out by loss of manufacturing. Um, and, and there, there are many people in, in, that you speak to who remember when it was different, you know, that when yeah. people were connected. But how about these young people who've come up and never knew these places as yeah. communities that cared for each other? And this, this is really the big issue um, in a lot of these small towns, that, that the folks who are there, um, all, it's either a generational cycle of, po- of poverty and, and, um, and drug abuse, or the people who are in it just can't remember anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, and granted that, that is an issue. That is one of the big issues. One of the reasons though, I focus on, on Portsmouth, Ohio at the very last, which is the, the Portsmouth, Ohio is the town that was really a centerpiece of dreamland. Uh, it's where the dreamland pool was. And that's why I named the book dreamland because of the whole episode with regard to that pool and how destroying digging up that pool kind of, and the job loss and all the people loss and the ends of main street to Walmart, all of that left that community very, very exposed, you know, but the reason I ended it, I went back to Portsmouth for the last chapter of this book was because I wanted to kind of show that in Portsmouth is Portsmouth's one town where you're finding people 
moving out of that um, that 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 kind of decay, and they're doing it not because some big factory has come to town and brought 250 jobs. They're doing it in small. Again, it's all about the small stuff, the small little moments, the small little events. Um, they're they're forming small companies that hire three to five people, not 50 people, not 250 uh, people. There are now there's a lot. There's four CrossFits. In, in Dreamland, people are, it's the county that led Ohio in obesity. And now people are saying, you know, forget that. And so if you go on, go on Instagram, go on Facebook, you see um, uh, Dreamland CrossFit and you'll see just videos of people working out. It's magnificent. It's wonderful. I love seeing their videos. It's always just people doing, you know, lifting and this, this, and that. It's beautiful. Um, it's, you're finding, you, you, you've now seen a couple of, of cafes. Cafes, I believe, are kind of almost barometers of how strong a community is. Because a cafe is a place where, and I'm talking not about Starbucks, but I'm talking mainly about independent cafes. Cafes are where people come together both to do business and to meet socially in one form or, or another. In, in, in Portsmouth, it's a radical thing because since the Dreamland pool, which was, was dug up and Dreamland was really like the town center it's where everybody saw each other for six months of the year, of the year. Um, it gets dug up and the only place they have to see one another is at Walmart now. Well, these cafes that a couple of them have been open, now they form a different place to meet and to get together and to start businesses or to talk about, you know, or to do your homework or whatever, you know, it's a beautiful thing. It's small, it's small scale. It's not, it's still, still struggling and all that, but it's so much more than what I remember from Portsmouth when I first went to that town back in 2013 for the first time. So to me, that's that's the, the thing. It's like, the, it, it illustrates what we need to be, the attitude, not exactly point by point, but the attitude we need to have, which is we can all do this. We form these connect connections that we've, we've lost at the local level, combine, synergize with like minds and like people who have similar energies. And you begin to develop these moments, these, these these urges, these surges, I guess, of, 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 um, of productivity and positivity that is really what leads to um, solutions to this problem at the local level. Yeah, that's good. With well, this journey from uh, judgment to empathy is happening in many places, as, as you're pointing yeah. out. Not just. I would say. Time. I would say too. I have to be honest. You know, there's the 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 judge the the journey from empathy to judgment too. Because as one caller or right uh, 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 um, member of the audience said, frequently drug addiction will wear you out as a loved one. It's just, it drains almost every resource you have: financial, um, love, trust, all of that will. And and that's. And that's why it seems to me that people need each other too. This is essential to, to drug addiction recovery is we need, we need that kind of feeling of, of the, the community coming together around an addict, but requiring to um, uh, accountability uh, from that person. It cannot just be, we're all trying to help you and you don't want to help. And you, you just, you know, we, we need a whole uh, that uh, for that to happen because one person going it alone will be drained of all energy, finance, love, et cetera, very, very quickly. And you find that a lot around the country as well. I have to say that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, of, of course it's, it's wearing, but, but, but this is, you know, not just happening in these small towns and suburbs and cities and, let's say that empathy has not historically been extended to addicts of color. Uh, and it begs the question, you know, if fentanyl and meth had not wiped out so many in working in middle-class white communities, what the yeah. response would be? No, it's a very good question. And, um, and this is part of why, why I wrote in the last uh, chapter that um, the pandemic, the opioid epidemic and Black Lives Matter all kind of were like, if you saw the Venn diagram, there were places where they all connect, intersected, you know, uh, the, the opioid epidemic is showing us the agony uh, that we create when we look for a pain free life and the, the problems that are based on that, that grow from our own isolation. The pandemic was showing us that um, that, 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 that isolation is a disaster for us. We know now, we know that now. And that so many people 
um, uh, uh, the, the most vulnerable. We're only as strong as the most vulnerable among us. We're only as strong as that meatpacking worker who all of a sudden we discovered was an essential worker to the American economy, if you remember. And then Black Lives Matter is showing is showing us that, that we cannot move forward uh, without uh, recognizing pain that's long ignored. And, 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 and all of that seems to me that there's connections between them, not entirely but um, if you think of the, 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 the words, the last words of George Floyd, I can't breathe. Well, those are the words of a, of a, of a truck driver who's dying of, of COVID in an ICU. It's also the words of an, of an addict who, who's uh, overdosed on, on an opioid and, and, and no longer is breathing. Um, it, to me, there feels like, like connections that, and these three things are trying to teach us certain lessons that I think we need to incorporate and understand about, first of all, how we've been living, how certain communities are treated, um, how, how certain people are viewed, particularly addicts, I would say of almost any color, honestly, um, where um, even though we all have the brain chemistry and to be addicted to something, we most likely many of us have been addicted to something. In my own case, I smoked for 15 years, addicted to, to nicotine. You know, we've been addicted to something. We can all be that addict eating from the trash. So th these are all connected in ways that I found uh, that I as I began to write, it occurred to me, yes, this is, this is the connections are there. Well, uh, there's so much in what you've just said. And, and in binding together in community, in these small acts, there is uh, an, there is a, there's an antidote to isolation, but there's yes. so much that's fighting against us. You know, you mentioned, um, you know, the, the the news model of having people absolutely immutable to non tunnel vision. They're not going to change their minds about anything. But you also point out that we're living in this mass marketing society that primes us even perhaps for addiction. Um, yes. Just more on this, you know, there, this brings into focus so many things, how the healthcare system takes care of people, how small towns with uh, just um, fire and emergency and police stations to deal with addiction, with, you know, courts that are strained by uh, addiction and overdose deaths and coroner's offices and all these little towns. Is there something that, how is this all tied together for you? Well, I, I mean, I think that, that again, it, it, initially I was told that this problem was all connected to economic devastation and certainly that's part of the mix. But I do believe now that it is really um, our own turning away from our basic instinct, what we evolved to need, and that is community. We, again, we would not have survived as a species without this feeling of needing to be near other people and be around other people and in you know connection with uh, other people and certainly I think we've learned we've seen that uh, in the last two 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 years so to me it's it's all about what we can do in the smallest ways to end that or to repair that or to bring people together so on your street I mean I really think it gets down into low tech things it's not a high tech solutions I don't think really I think it's having a barbecue on your street, having a block party, um, you know, getting to being outside, being along, being around other Americans, even those you don't think you, you have much in common with or you don't like them because they didn't vote for your president. Um, you know, all of that kind of stuff is, is um, I believe, what we need to do. And when you start doing that, I have found in my life and, 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 and my reporting as well, that once you start doing that, people start there, there begins to be a kind of a synergy of ideas among people. So all of a sudden, those problems that seem so almost soluble when we're all isolated, now have a, you can find a little bit of a pathway uh, forward. And this is, I think, um, essential to our approach to, to dealing with drug addiction because it's such a, a, a wearying, um, a, a caustic, corrosive kind of thing in our society. And it so often leads to giving up and oh, what can we do and there's nothing to do. I know I think I don't believe that. I believe that there's a lot of things we can do. I think we need to get away from the idea that there's one solution. That was the whole pain. That was the whole opioid problem, right? What was the opioid issue? Let's let's, you know, cure all American, all in human pain with one pill. It's an insane idea. I think we're gonna look back on those 20 some years and thinking, Think later, God, do you believe it's like leeches, blood, you know, the, the, the old methods of, of doing medicine 500 years ago. We'll look back and go, what on earth were people thinking? 
So to me, these are these are some of the again the lessons that I think are so important. It's why I filled the book really with half the half the stories in the book are really not about fentanyl and methamphetamine. It's about how people in the smallest of ways are coming together. And it's it's also why I turn to the Bible. I'm not a Christian, but I turn to the Bible as kind of a guide through this book. Um, and it became so as I read, and particularly the book of Matthew, the idea of, you know, that what you do for the least. Uh, of my brethren, you do, you do, you do for me. I began to see that that was the approach that that we needed to understand was the most potent. Once we're once we take that approach, that is a really potent approach. There's very little can stand in the way of a of a of a, a community that is working. I think together and that takes into account the the people who are at the lowest end. Requiring accountability from those folks, but also understanding that they need they need a hand up. Sam Canonis, I want to thank you so much for inspiring us with that and for your your reporting on this book and for being with us tonight. Virginia, it's so nice of you to do this. I really appreciate the very thoughtful questions. Thank you very, very much for doing this. Appreciate My it. My pleasure. We do encourage you to support this program and all the great work of the History Center by purchasing your copy of The Least of Us at AtlantaHistoryCenter.com. So glad to have you with us this evening. In some way, a virtual community, all of us coming together. Please do join us next Wednesday, that's February 2nd, when Tamiko Brown Nagan will be talking about her book, Civil Rights Queen with the great, ever great Rose Scott. There's a full schedule and Zoom links at atlantahistorycenter.com. Thank you so much for joining us. Do support Sam and the History Center by buying your book there and have a great evening. Thank you. Good night, guys. See you. Thanks, Virginia. Thank you.